Welcome to the third episode of Geopolitics with Alex and we'll continue on the theme of Russian aggression and the war in Ukraine. And today we'll be looking at the short-term implications, the medium-term implications and the long-term implications of this war. And of course it's a little bit risky uh, in the sense that we're looking at the future, we cannot really predict it. There is however quite a nice saying from the tech industry, it says, if you want to predict the future, you have to invent it. Uh, and let's try to do that today. So let's begin first with the short-term uh, situation. I think really it's still about war and peace. Um, and I don't think that Russia has changed its tactic or strategy in uh, any which way. It's still twofold for Putin. One is to have the land corridor to the Crimean Peninsula, and the other one is basically to use uh, energy uh, as a weapon. And of course, we saw uh, just in the past week uh, that Putin was trying to test the limits of hybrid warfare by most probably um, attacking uh, the Nord Stream pipelines going through the Baltic uh, Sea. So the strategy from the Russian perspective hasn't really changed. We saw the referenda and the annexation of the semi-occupied uh, territories uh, combined, of course, with the partial and at times quite farcical mobilization of, of Russian troops. So what we're learning of this situation is that Putin is getting increasingly desperate, or if not desperate, at least his options uh, for acting uh, are quite limited. So he's losing, I think, in the battlefield, uh, as we've seen in this uh, past week. Uh, he's also losing at home because popularity of what is going on has been reduced and he's probably feeling quite a lot of pressure from the international community. And here I mean more specifically countries that have given him at least partial support or not strong condemnation, countries such as uh, China uh, and India. It was interesting to see the uh, Shanghai meeting uh, where there was actually quite strong criticism uh, in diplomatic terms at least coming from both India and China uh, towards uh, Russia. So don't be surprised that the language that Putin is using here short term is actually quite harsh. It's about nuclear weapons and it's also about creating uh, national uh, sentiment. Now, I think there are two black swans that we could expect here, which are sort of opposites. The first black swan would be that suddenly Putin, in the short term, would declare a ceasefire and say, okay, you know, we don't want to fight with Ukraine. And this would be a black swan in the sense that it would be very difficult to predict what would the West do uh, and what would uh, Ukraine do. I actually think that Ukraine would continue to uh, fight to get back the territories and I actually think that the West would continue to support Ukraine. But nevertheless, it would be quite a shrewd move from him to say that, you know, the war is over, I'm seeking for, for peace. Uh, then the second black swan that we might get here and I, I don't say this lightly, is, 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 is the use of tactical nuclear weapons. I think people are sort of floating this idea a, a little bit too lightly as if it wasn't a big deal and that it's, it's just... I, I still think that it's unlikely, uh, but, you know, and he's saying that, that he's not bluffing. Well, bluffing or not, we have to take that threat seriously. And that's why it's good, for instance, that I think uh, according to reports, the American administration is in close conversation with Russia about this. Now, uh, the reason that he might not use it is not so much the deterrent from NATO, but probably the deterrent that he would lose any support he would have from the international uh, community, meaning in this case China or India. It's just, it's a place where you really uh, don't want to go. But the reason I'm still worried is that we don't know whether Putin is already beyond that so what kind of stage. So these two, two black swans. 
Now, in the short term, because this is about war and peace, I, I am now going to make a proposal or at least test you with, with an idea which I would like for you to comment as well. Now, we of course have this peace camp and justice camp. Peace, wants, peace camp wants peace at all costs and justice camps want, want, want justice at all costs. So could it be that a transactional peace would have the following two elements? Number one, Ukraine would get back the territories uh, that are now semi-occupied by Russia, the four, including, therefore, Crimea. In a transaction of that, Ukraine would allow a situation whereby Russia would not be prosecuted in international co courts. I just put out this as a proposal, so get the four territories back, but don't take Russia into international courts. I'm not necessarily saying that I support this, but sometimes in, in these war-peace situations, you know, idealism meets realism, and I'd be really interesting, interested to, to uh, hear uh, your comments on this. So medium term, Russian strategy remains the same. Ukraine will continue to fight back. Uh, and then let's see whether we can already start talking about some kind of a settlement. Probably not there yet, but I'm looking at short term. And for me, short term is half a year to about a year. Now, the second um, question or, or area that I want to discuss today is, is the medium term. And here I I think it's very important that, that we in the West, or especially those countries supporting Ukraine, uh, begin uh, to understand that we have to start talking uh, about the uh, reconstruction uh, of Ukraine at, at some stage. Not only the reconstruction, but also the integration of Ukraine to Western institutions. Why do I say this? I say it because I think uh, that we are looking at a divided Europe where on one side of the um, barbed wire or fence we're going to have Russia and on the other side the rest of Europe. I've talked about 40 plus countries, of course, including uh, Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine uh, and then the Western Balkans. But we need to start talking about this. And of course, when we're talking about integration of Ukraine, um, there is the path towards European membership or European Union membership, which has already started. But now there has been an application for a swift inclusion into NATO. I fully realize that this is a difficult conversation to have, but it's a conversation that we're going to have, I think, in uh, the medium term. Why is this difficult? Well, the reconstruction is difficult because it'll require money, and the integration is difficult because it basically means, in the long run, possible EU membership and NATO membership uh, uh, in uh, the future. Now, in the medium term, I believe that Russia will not get through this without regime change. And, and I say this, of course, carefully, and I guess I can say it as an academic, uh, but I think what Russia really has to decide on is it going to be a country with a leadership that only looks into the past and is basically revisionist? Or is it going to be a country that looks into the future? Now, for many of you, it might feel a little bit too early to talk about this. And I fully understand that. Uh, and I buy that argument. But at the same time, I, I, I do think that in order for Russia to get out of this impasse, uh, there will have to be um, uh, uh, regime change. I also predict that there will be unrest uh, in Russia and especially in the near abroad uh, of Russia. And it could even mean some kind of you know, territorial instability and detachment. I'm not saying like the collapse of the Soviet Union and the creation of independent states, but there are areas in Russia and near abroad which are not necessarily uh, very stable and this could uh, become a, a, a conversation. Now, do I belong to the category that believes that in the medium term, so say five to ten years, Russia becomes a democracy? Well, I want to say so, but it's a little bit wishful thinking or, or a hope, um, because regime change and, and systemic change 
usually happens quite slowly. And of course, what we've seen from Russia before, and many other countries for that matter, when there is instability, the regime is usually placed by stability. And that stability is usually hardline rather than softline. Um, of course, you know, Boris Yeltsin after Gorbachev and the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, was a different kettle of fish. But in between, there was a military junta um, before Yeltsin came in. And then, of course, after Yeltsin, uh, there was uh, Putin. So perhaps a bit more of a hardliner uh, and, 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 and someone looking for security. Now, my third and final approach is the long term. And, and this is even more complicated than the short term and the medium short term. But but let me let me give it a try. I think the first observation that we have to make is that we will end up with a new security order in Europe. You know, the old one was based on the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, the Helsinki Accords from 1975, then onwards with the Paris Accords in the early 1990s. And, and this sort of idea that, you know, there were some basic elements in the international order that everyone sticks to. They have to do with territorial sovereignty, uh, integrity, independence, uh, conflict, and many other things. And I, you know, this has now been violated. It was violated by Russia, of course, in the war in Georgia in 2008, with the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula in 2014. And now, of course, um, with the war in Ukraine on the eastern and partially uh, you know, southern flanks. So it's very complicated. So if Russia doesn't stick to the rules, something else has to come into its place. I, again, I don't have a clear idea what it could be, but if Europe is split into two, there are going to be the countries that are in NATO and in the EU, and then on one side there's going to be Russia. And Russia really needs to figure out what it is. Now, the big question is that if Russia were to lose this war, which I, I'm beginning to believe that it will, if Russia loses this war, then I think we're in a situation whereby the winners will be setting the conditions. And, and this is going to be complicated. Are we going to go for a Versailles type of deal where you basically humiliate the loser? Or are you going to find some kind of an alternative solution? I, I simply don't have the answer to that. But I think we have to start thinking um, uh, about it. Now, I also keep on stressing, and I, I say this once again, that in the long term, this is not only about Russia and the West. This is also about the West and the rest. And by that I mean to say, and I repeat again from our previous lectures, that, that we have a world order right now, or what I actually call a world disorder, which was established in the post-World War II era uh, in the image of the winners of World War II. It was also established in the image of Western powers, you know, whether it was the IMF, the World Bank, uh, you know, even the UN, the UN Security Council, granted there is, of course, China nowadays in it, but nevertheless, the WTO, it was all created in the West. And I, I don't think the rest of the world is, is, is going to buy this. So I, I think that the war in Ukraine and Russian aggression will instigate some kind of a change, which the West has to be prepared to deal with. Now, here is basically where I think principles meet pragmatism or, say, idealism meets realism in, in world politics. Now, am I sitting here and saying that we need international norms and institutions which undermine and compromise our basic values in the West. No, I don't. That's not my message at all. But what I'm trying to say is that if we have 200 nation states in the world, roughly speaking, not all of those are going to abide by the same basic set of values and norms that have been created in the Western image. So we don't have to compromise on our values, but we have to understand that not everyone will follow. So I think that we are now in a situation where we have to start slowly at least looking at the short term of war and peace, the medium term of war and peace, and then the long term of uh, war and peace from the conflict, from the war uh, in Ukraine. And I come back 
to the tech folks who I still think have a very good way of, 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 of framing it. In other words, they say, if you want to predict the future, you have to invent it. So now, please, I know this was a difficult uh, episode to record because it talks about the future, but I would be really interesting, interested to hear your views where this conflict is going short term, medium term and long term. I'll be reading all of your comments soon. Thanks for listening.